Good morning. I'll start the topic today on inorganic nomenclature by talking about the different types of chemical bonds. And there's a difference then between covalent bonds and ionic bonds. This slide indicates uh, or shows the covalent bonding scenario. And we'll just keep it simple at this point and say that um, these lines single lines here represent two electrons and the two electrons are going to be shared between the two atoms in the bond so it'd be two electrons between the carbon and hydrogen for example in the bond of methane and in the case of methane there are going to be four covalent bonds on the top structure uh, you have the Lewis representation which is just the lines to indicate bonding the number of bonds are correct, uh, but it doesn't say anything about the geometry or the bond angles. So we have another representation <coughs> called VESPER, and that stands for Valence Shell Electron Pair Repulsion Theory, and this is the, the structure that results from it. We're going to talk about that in a lot of detail later. <coughs> But you can see that uh, carbon's in the middle, and then there's four hydrogens. But now they're uh, they seem to be at the the hydrogens seem to be at the corners of the tetrahedral pyramid. So there's uh, some geometry here associated with uh, the structure. Anyway, we'll just focus on just simple covalent bonding and we'll just think about covalent bonds in, as lines uh, representing electrons. All right, the other type of bonding is ionic and um, this is going to be an elect electrostatic interaction between charged ions and the ionic bonds. How do you know you have an ionic bond? It's going to be formed between a metal and a nonmetal as opposed to covalent on the last slide where it's going to be formed covalent bonds are formed between two nonmetals. <clears throat> so we can think about the ions, the formation of the ions, use neutral sodium and neutral chlorine as the example. Uh, sodium tends to lose an electron to form sodium plus, chloride gains an electron to form chloride. And what changes during the formation of the ion? Uh, sodium has 11 protons when it's neutral. If it's neutral, it's going to have 11 electrons. And then you can just pick some number of neutrons to represent a particular isotope. The number of neutrons doesn't change during the process of um, ion formation. So uh, in order to form the sodium plus ion, one of the uh, 11 electrons gets removed. And uh, then there's going to be 10 left. Probably want to complete this, uh, this equation by saying plus an electron, plus an electron. Um, then the chlorine, which is 17 protons, uh, we pick the 35 isotopes, so it's got 18 neutrons. And if it's neutral, it's going to have 17 electrons to match the 17 protons. And then when it gains the electron that the sodium has given up, now it's got 18 electrons instead of 17 electrons. And notice it's got one more electron than protons, so therefore it's going to have a negative charge. So here's uh, just some pictures that uh, come from the Tro book. Um, the purple on the first uh, figure represents the sodium metal. It's just the, the neutral atoms that are aligned um, in the lattice sites uh, in a cubic orientation. And then chlorine, of course, is gas phase. And so you'll have diatomic chlorine molecules kind of floating around. When they react together, the sodium plus and the chloride are formed, and then they arrange themselves in a solid. In this case, you've got um, large chloride ions that um, kind of form the framework for the cube, and then the little purple sodium ions are uh, kind of fill in the spaces there. So you, once again you have a solid and that's, that is the sodium chloride solid. <clears throat> so it's an electrostatic interaction between the negative chloride and the positive uh, sodium ions. 
All right, just keep it simple. Uh, what's the difference between organic and inorganic uh, compounds? Organic compounds contain carbon. Inorganic uh, compounds do not contain carbon. And there are examples of covalent and ionic associated with organic and inorganic, and we won't worry about that too much um, at this point. You'll just see it as we go along. All right, so the nomenclature for the inorganic compounds, for the most part, uh, will involve ionic bonding. And we'll start with the uh, very interesting periodic chart of the ions. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, since the naming depends on where the elements come from or where the ions come from, let us just delineate a few things here. This red, this is type 1. Those are called representative elements. The blue are going to be type 2 elements or metal ions, type 2. So these are the transition metals. And these are the representative metals. Okay, and then um, let's get some other colors here. Here's green. Green is going to represent the post transition elements and start at the top here with aluminum and come down gallium and then tin and then down to bismuth like that. These are going to be the post transition elements Okay, we're not going to worry too much about the uh, metalloids, but then the nonmetals are going to have in yellow here phosphorus, selenium, and then over to iodine like that. So these are going to be the, we can include the rare gases in these, not so crucial here. But all of this yellow here, these are going to be the um, nonmetals, as you know. That one doesn't show up very well. Nonmetals. Okay. So, um, for the formation of the ionic compounds, it's either going to be between a type 1 metal and a nonmetal, or a type 2 metal and a nonmetal, or a post transition element and a nonmetal. So in general it's metal and nonmetal, but then there are these three different types uh, representative, transition, and post transition. So we'll uh, look at those in some detail. Alright, so first we're going to start with just the um, Just looking at the representative elements, what's so unique about them, uh, representative metals I should say, they, the answer is that they only have one charge. And so you have this type 1 associated with the metals that only have one charge so associated with groups uh, 1A and 2A. <clears throat> so they're binary. Binary means that there are just two elements. And then ionic tells you it's formed between uh, one of these representative metals and then some nonmetal over here. All right, metal and nonmetal. So um, we want to be able to put together the um, ions to form the compound. And um, if you look at this part right here, you can see this very simple crisscross relationship. Um, this is a nice periodic table because it gives you the charges. Calcium is in group 2A, and so it's got that plus 2 charge right here. And then nitrogen over here has uh, got a 3 minus charge, and so there'll be an electrostatic interaction between them. So the details are the following. You want to write down 
calcium 2 plus and then nitrogen 3 minus and then just kind of do the math. You need three positive twos plus two negative threes to add together to form zero and I have it written out here. Three plus twos, that's for calcium, and then two negative threes, that's for the nitrogen, the sum is zero. So then when you write your answer, you don't put the charges in calcium plus two nitrogen minus three, you just put the subscripts which tell you the number of elements that are um, ions that are going to combine. So that would be the answer. Now uh, over here, let's see what else, this part. In this part there's just some more examples to illustrate the naming of the compounds. So you have the cation and the anion, the positive ion and the negative ion, and the rule is you write down the name of the cation, sodium. You start to name the anion, chlor. You stop and you put IDE. IDE tells you that it's a binary compound, that there's just two elements. So you have aluminum. You start to name the oxygen. You stop and put IDE. This is a binary compound. There's just two elements. You have potassium nitride, calcium phosphide, so they're similar. All right, simple ones. The harder ones are the type 2, uh, binary ionic type 2 compounds. And as I said, we've got the transition metals basically in here, and then the post transition metals in this region here. All right, go back and look for another second. Um, that the transition metals and the post-transition metals um, can, not always, but can have more than one charge. So nickel, for example, can be plus two or plus three. Cobalt can be plus two or plus three. Copper can be plus two and plus one. There's nothing magic about plus three and plus two. Copper can be plus two and plus one. And where's another good example here? Lead um, is plus uh, two and plus four. So now, actually go back. Okay, so <clears throat> here are some examples where you've got uh, iron plus three plus two, cobalt plus three plus two, and this is a mixture here of the transition and the post-transition metals, ions, metal ions. The systematic name versus the common name you want to be aware of. The systematic name you need to know by heart. And then the common name, uh, you need to, I'm telling you about them because they're interesting, but you don't have to memorize them, and I'm not going to ask you for them on a test. So the question I'm sure you're asking is, do you have to memorize these different charges? The answer is no. You can figure it out from the formula. But you do need to know that the transition metals and the post-transition metals can have more than one charge. Not always, but they often can. So the names are simple, iron 3 and iron 2, cobalt 3, cobalt 2, co copper 2, copper 1, and so on. Um, mercury is a little bit interesting here. Uh, you can see simply mercury 2 plus, and so um, it's going to be the mercury 2 ion. But this one is uh, different. You can think of mercury as a dimer, so it exists as 2... I'm not going to, I'm going to draw a line here. It doesn't really mean a covalent bond, but just to say that, um, hold on, oops, get rid of that thing. Didn't mean that. And so, um, anyway, the point here is that it exists as a dimer with an overall 2 plus charge, which means that each mercury has a 1 plus charge, and that's why you call it mercury 1, or mercurius. And then uh, here's this crisscross relationship again. This is with titanium 4 and nitrogen 3 minus. And um, same thing, you need to have three, whoops, put on my pointer there. You need three, um, plus fours for titanium, plus four negative threes for nitrogen, 
so that the sum is going to be equal to zero. And then when you write your answer, you don't put the charges on the top here. It's just three titaniums and four nitrogens. Okay, so here would be a typical question on a test. What are the formulas of the compounds formed between iron 2 and chlorine? So you're given iron 2 and um, you would have to figure out using the crisscross relationship that there's going to be two chlorides for every one iron and then I would ask you to name the compound and of course you have to remember that uh, it could be iron 2 or iron 3 and so you want to put the Roman numerals in for the transition or post transition metals. All right, you have lead, uh, what is the formula for the compound form between lead 2 and oxygen? Both uh, lead is plus 2, oxygen is minus 2, so it's just going to be a one-to-one -one relationship. The name is, you got to put the Roman numeral in there, lead 2 oxide. Notice uh, it's still a binary compound, so you, you name the metal lead 2. You start to name the anion ox. You stop and you put IDE in there, so that's similar. Okay, all right, and um, <clears throat> now moving away from the ionic compounds, next is covalent, and the first example is binary covalent, and you can see from these examples, each of these covalent molecules has only two elements, so that's why they're binary. Why are they covalent? Because they are formed between two nonmetals. So remember the ionic, it's going to be metal and nonmetal. Covalent, it's going to be between two nonmetals. And in that case, your naming is completely different. You're going to use mono, di, tri, tetra, penta, hexahepta, octanona, and deca. So um, here are some examples. N205, what would be the name? You're going to say di nitrogen because there's two nitrogens. Pent, uh, it would be five. Notice in this case, you've got penta, you leave off the A and whenever there's an, uh, an, um, an O coming up. So you leave off the A and you just say pent instead of penta and then ox for oxygen and then IDE. So you've got in the name that there are two nitrogens and five oxygens and that it's binary. Okay. So then uh, another good example here is carbon monoxide. You might want to think, uh, you might say that it might, that it would be monocarbon monoxide, and that is not completely wrong, except the convention is that we leave off the mono in front of the first element in the name. So here we might say monocarbon dioxide, but we leave off the mono on the first one. On the other hand, the second element, we leave it, we put it in monoxide to differentiate between one oxygen and two. Okay, so there is no crisscross relationship here. Something similar is going on with oxidation numbers, but uh, that is a topic that's down the road for us. So basically, you just um, have the formula and you want to know what the name is, or you have the name and you want to write the formula deduce the formula based on the name. All right, now we have um, binary acids and they're going to be formed between hydrogen and nonmetals and those are simple, you know those. For the most part they're the halogens, HF, HCl, HBr, and HI, but then you can also look at sulfur and selenium. Those can form uh, binary acids as well. Now you want to differentiate between aqueous phase and gas phase and you want to write AQ or G to indicate that. And um, so for example you have hydrofluoric acid versus hydrogen fluoride. The name is completely different and it just indicates the different phases. And then um, what else? I think that's probably it for that. Okay, so the names are completely different uh, depending on the phase. Okay, now uh, these are the oxy acids, and then you can deduce the polyatomic ions from the oxy acids. 
So this is not a complete list of polyatomic ions. There are more on an upcoming slide, but these are the, some of them that can be deduced from the oxy acid itself. So the oxy acid is formed between hydrogen, nonmetal, and oxygen. So between hydrogen, oxygen, and some nonmetal. Hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon in this case. Hydrogen, oxygen, and fluorine and uh, phosphorus in this case. All right, so now this gets a little confusing as well because the amount of oxygen associated with the nonmetal can change. And so uh, carbonic acid is simple, but if you look at phosphoric IC versus phosphorus, OUS, you have four and three oxygens in the compound. Sulfuric is similar. You have uh, IC and OUS, sulfuric and sulfurous acid, uh, differentiating between four oxygens and three. But you can be fooled because um, the IC and the OUS doesn't really correlate with the numbers four and three, it, four and three. It just means greater and lesser numbers of oxygens. So IC is greater four, OUS is lesser three. When you look at nitric acid, you see the numbering is different. So the three here corresponds to the greater number. And so it would have nitric, OU, uh, um, OUS, nitrous, corresponds to the lesser number, which is 2. All right, so fairly simple until you get down to the halogens. These can be chlorines, fluorines, iodines, or bromines. So watch for those. And um, now, instead of just having two like these guys, there's actually four. The naming for the ones in the middle I put in blue the middle of the list of four here. I put in blue because they're the ones that are similar to the ones above. So the three and the two oxygens we are going to call chloric and chlorus. But then uh, when there's greater than three, in this case four, we say per. Per uh, means as many as possible. And then hypo would be um, associated with just one oxygen. So it's like chlorus, only it's hypochlorous. Hypo means it's going to be the smallest amount possible, smallest number possible. All right, now, uh, whenever you put these acids in water in general, they're going to lose the hydrogens. And so they form the polyatomic ions. And just a simple example here might be... Um, nitric acid. So if you have HNO3 and put it in water, the hydrogen will hook up with the water. And it does so by losing H+. Now this H+, that I'm putting above the arrow, is not coming from anywhere. It's just part of the notation. That's this H that's coming off in the form of the H+. Plus. So we just put it above the arrow sometimes to indicate that it's the hydrogen that's coming off here is coming off in the form of H+. Plus. And so that's going to make the product nitrate, NO3 minus, and then plus this hydrogen, the H+, plus, has uh, formed a, reacted with H2O to form H3O+, plus, which is called hydronium. So this one right here, H3O plus, is called hydronium. Hydronium. Whoops, spelled that very badly. If I can erase that. I-U-M. I-U-M. <clears throat> hydronium ion. Okay. And then the nitrate here should be aqueous, AQ. Okay, so you end up with the polyatomic ion, which is probably the main point. Now, in the case of uh, the diprotic acid, carbonic acid, if you, if you let it lose both hydrogens, then you're going to have the 2 minus ion. In the case of the phosphoric and phosphorous acids, if you lose all three of the hydrogens, then you can take it down to the polyatomic ion, uh, phosphate, phosphite, and so on. All right, so do you have to know the names of everything on this page? Yes, absolutely, 100%.
And also watch for if we had HBrO3, that would be bromic acid, and then it would be BrO3 minus, it would be bromate, and so on with the halogens. All right, in addition to those polyatomic ions, here's a bunch more that you need to know. Uh, not too many positive ones, the rest of them are negatives, and some of them are a little funny, superoxide and oxide and peroxide, for example, these three are worth mentioning. But uh, maybe we'll just, for the moment, look at um, making a compound, an ionic compound with a polyatomic ion. So what if we had copper 2 plus and um, acetate CH3 CO2 minus. So you would, you're going to need two acetates for every one copper in order to be neutral. So they're going to combine to form copper acetate and there'll be two of those. And notice we do not put the charges copper 2 plus and minus one for acetate. All right, so you want to put the uh, polyatomic ions with the metals. And the name of this is going to be um, copper 2 acetate. So you got to put the Roman numeral in because copper is a transition metal. Okay, so maybe... Um, a note about oxygen. Let me see. Um, so you can have oxygen two minus, which is oxide. Maybe there'd be a compound with sodium, which would be sodium oxide. Okay, then um, sometimes you see, put a line here, sometimes you see a formula like this, sodium oxide. I have to stop that for a minute. All right, sorry. Um, so sodium oxide with two oxygens. And um, here you have to think about this a little bit. The sodium you know is gonna be plus one. And so in order for the compound to be neutral, oxygen has to be negative one half. So it would be one sodium times plus one charge plus two oxygens, each one negative a half is going to be equal to zero. So here we have the example of oxygen has um, negative one-half charge and that is called the superoxide. Okay, and then finally you have uh, compounds like this, H2O2, and those this particular one is peroxide, or hydrogen peroxide, I should say. And um, so the O2 minus, O2 2 minus is going to be peroxide. So let's look at another color here, red. <clears throat> Each hydrogen is plus one, and the only way you can think about this is that each oxygen is going to be minus one. So you've got two of them, so you have O2, 2 minus, or you could say O minus 1. Same thing, that's going to be a peroxide. So um, peroxide has a minus 1 charge. And uh, superoxides and peroxides both exist in nature, uh, certainly in many biological systems. 
These are very highly reactive oxygen species involved in oxidation and um, you may have heard from in your biology classes of superoxide dismutase. That's going to be an enzyme that breaks up this superoxide, which is very reactive. These uh, s these species can form um, cancer. You know, indirectly, they're going to affect cells, and there's strong oxidation associated with them. And uh, so then then they're enzymes um, available that can uh, keep the concentrations of them low enough so that they don't do damage. But they're very important in terms of uh, decomposition of um, molecules. All right, so oxygen's unusual. You got oxygen 2 minus, oxygen minus, and oxygen uh, negative a half. So there's all three. You just got to be aware of them. Oops. Now here we have uh, sodium hydrogen sulfate, this is going to be the um, systematic name. Bisulfate is going to be the common name. You can use either one, I don't really care. Same thing with sodium hydrogen carbonate. Uh, this is a systematic name, and then sodium bicarbonate is going to be the common name. Um, now, it's worth talking about these for a few minutes as well. Let me get some black uh, ink here. Okay, and I'm going to do another page for these. So, sodium hydrogen sulfate, you can think of it this way. Um, sulfuric acid, and if you remove one hydrogen, and maybe through reaction with sodium hydroxide, you could have sodium hydrogen sulfate. That's a four. And then if you remove that second, this one right here, the second hydrogen, then um, you would end up with two sodiums to make it neutral and sodium sulfate. Okay. So you could think of these three as kind of going together. Uh, the details here would be the following. So let's react sulfuric acid with sodium hydroxide. It's going to take two sodium hydroxides to neutralize sulfuric acid to form sodium sulfate and uh, we're going to look at the stepwise process. So <clears throat> sulfuric acid, and this is all aqueous, so I'm not going to put the phases in, is going to react with sodium hydroxide and um, one of the hydrogens here, the H pluses, is going to come over and react with the OH minus. And so uh, you'll have a sodium plus then uh, ending up with the hydrogen sulfate. So it would be sodium hydrogen sulfate plus a water molecule where the H plus and the OH combine to form water. Okay, then this sodium hydrogen sulfate will react in the second step. So you have sodium hydrogen sulfate and let it react with another molecule of sodium hydroxide. And you're going to get a similar reaction where this H plus comes over, reacts with the OH minus in the sodium hydroxide. And then now you've got an additional sodium present to form a sodium with two sodiums combining with sulfate to form sodium sulfate plus a second water molecule has been formed. Okay, then you can add these up and when you do, the sodium hydrogen sulfate here and here will cancel and you're going to have the overall that sulfuric acid reacts with two sodium hydroxides to form sodium sulfate plus two waters. That's the overall balanced equation for that. So you've got sodium hydrogen sulfate being formed and then it's being used up in the second step. So the point of all this is only uh, the nomenclature and what is this thing, sodium hydrogen sulfate? Well, 
that it's pretty important uh, in terms of the neutralization of sulfuric acid. And um, you also could say the same thing about carbonic acid. And let me do that one in red. So that's the other one on the previous page. So H2CO3, it's kind of intermediate on the way to neutralization would be sodium hydrogen carbonate, and that's the one that, the, whose name you have to learn. And then as it reacts with a, a second sodium hydroxide molecule, then you're going to have sodium carbonate. Okay, so there's two systems that you want to uh, think about. No, the name's up. Alrighty, and then, and then finally let's go ahead and name some of these compounds. Um, I guess we can do it together. <laughs> this is going to be, it would be monophosphorus pentachloride, but of course you're going to leave off the mono, mono. How do you know this? This is formed between two nonmetals. So this is covalent. So phosphorus pentachloride. <clears throat> Similarly, the NF3 is covalent, so this is going to be nitrogen trifluoride. Next one is going to be ionic because it's a metal and a polyatomic ion. And um, let's see, sulfate is going to be minus 2. So if you've got two silvers, each silver is going to be plus 1. If you look in the periodic table, uh, the chart for the ions, you'll see that it's only got one charge. You could just write silver without the 1, but if you put it in, I'm fine with that. Sulf silver sulfate would be the name. Next one is going to be mercury 2 carbonate. Uh, next one will be copper 2 chloride. Next one will be um, zinc. Zinc is another one that's just got one charge, so you could just write zinc, or you could write zinc 2 nitrate. Here's the hydrogen sulfate, calcium. So it's a type 1 metal. You don't, there's no Roman numeral here. Calcium, hydrogen, sulfate. Vanadium can be plus 3. In this case is because hydroxide is minus 1. So vanadium, 3, hydroxide. And then um, the last one is an oxy acid, and you have the possibility of uh, bromic or bromus, perbromic, hypobromus. So this one is going to be bromus, B R O M O U S acid, bromous acid there. All right, and then the next one, write the formulas associated with the following names. So you have to do the crisscross relationship. You've got, um, let's see, copper and sulfate. Sulfate's minus two. Copper, in this case, is plus one, so you're gonna need two of those. So your answer is gonna be copper two sulfate. Okay, calcium chromate. You've got calcium and CrO4. That's 2 minus, calcium's 2 plus, so the answer is going to be calcium chromate, like that. Uh, next one will be KMNO4, potassium permanganate. Next one, let's look at this in detail, chromium and sulfur. Sulfur's minus 2, chromium's plus 3, so 2 and 3. This will be chromium 2, uh, sulfur 3. Uh, Nitrous acid, HNO2, as opposed to nitric acid. And then sodium hypochlorite. You can write it as NaClO 
or you could write N-A-O-C-L. Um, you see it either way for a sodium hypochlorite. Right, and then finally, the formulas uh, for compounds form between the following. You've got Fe2 and phosphate 3 minus. So this is going to be Fe3PO42. Uh, in the second example, iron is plus 3, phosphate is plus 3. So this is just going to be simply FePO4. In the third example, you've got um, iron 2 and phosphite. Phosphite is plus uh, minus 3. So you've got um, yep, iron 2 plus and PO3, 3 minus. So this is going to be Fe3, PO3, 2. And then the last one will be, so that's this one, the last one will be um, iron is 3 and phosphide is 3, so it'll just be FEPO3. All right, that is your first lecture on inorganic nomenclature. The second lecture is going to be on organic nomenclature. Hopefully I can post that by tomorrow.